Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, sitting down for an Xbox News update. We got a lot to talk about today. Brand new details on Redfall. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, oh my God, I think my days of only talking about like rumors and leaks might be slowly coming to an end. We'll always have those, but I'm like, Xbox has games to talk about. What is this like? <laughs> so here we go. We're gonna start off by talking about Redfall in today's video. We're also going to dive into the Xbox Bethesda Game Showcase Extended for this year, which is where we sit down, we see a lot of developer interviews. There were a couple of announcements, a couple of reveals there that you may have missed, so I wanted to put them in this video. And last but not least, IGN had a great article about Obsidian Entertainment and how life has been for them since joining Xbox, and it provides some interesting insight on how Xbox has structured deals since 2014 in their acquisition season. It's very enlightening. So with that, if you're new here, you're looking for Xbox news and information, consider subscribing, you're in the right place. And with that, let's get started with Redfall. But first, a word from our sponsor. What do you think you're doing? Uh, I am playing Turtles in Time, getting ready for Shredder's Revenge on Game Pass, baby. What's up? You're procrastinating. Procrastinating what? You're supposed to be learning how to make the next TMNT Shredder's Revenge on Skillshare. <laughs> We're halfway through 2022. You might be taking a look in the mirror asking yourself, what have you done this year? And honestly, it's never too late to start learning. That's why I like Skillshare, because you can go over and learn about literally anything, like I did with Jack Donaldson's Learn Video Game Development and Programming class available on Skillshare. It was there that I learned about navigating through the engine known as Unity, the steps required for game creation, programming fundamentals, so on and so forth. Programming's always been a rough spot for me, and I found this class insanely helpful. And that's why Skillshare is great, because it can apply to anything that you may be struggling to learn or do wish to learn. So provided you're interested, the first 1,000 viewers of mine to sign up and use my link in the description will get one free month trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. As many of you know, this is a game that I wasn't too hot on during the Xbox Bethesda Showcase, much to many people's dismay, but sorry, just kind of remind me a lot of Far Cry, except vampire -y, which could be cool, we'll see. It's a game that I think I'm gonna need to put my hands on over an extended period of time to really get a feel for things. And one of the quotes here, I'll point it out, is why that's the case. So let's get reading some of these previews from Game Informer. Let's imagine you and I select Devinder characters and we squad up to play together, Bear says. By the time we're 10 hours into the game, my Devinder probably is different than yours. I spent my skill points on different things and wear a firefighter costume. And now, now the cosmetic stuff, I, I, don't, I don't care about that. But one thing Arcane does really well, I think back to like Dishonored 2, where you had the two protagonists and then you had different powers to suit different chaotic or not chaotic play styles. And that was the real flexibility of the gameplay systems being shown there, again, best stealth game of the generation, Dishonored 2. If you have yet to play it, it's on Game Pass. Do yourself a favor, go enjoy that bad boy. However, if there's one thing that Arcane does really well, even in Deathloop, it's providing diverse play styles. And if that's what they can do in a co-op open world, I could see myself enjoying that. However, unfortunately, in this new content dump with Redfall, we have learned a little bit of, I'd say, bad news on how multiplayer works, and I'll explain why I don't think it's that great, but for now, let's keep reading. The article continues on saying, along with completing missions to progress the story, players must take back the city from the vampires. Redfall consists of two huge districts, each housing a variety of neighborhoods and a player base. Quote, we deliberately chose community houses, Smith adds, the first one is a firehouse, end quote. A special mission allows you to liberate a community, making that area a little safer to navigate. Taking territories also brings ramifications, but Smith and Bear wouldn't reveal what they are. I do like to hear that, that the world will be reactive and potentially dangerous. So that's something that we will have to see over time, but I am curious about. For me, y'all know how I feel about arcane games. It's about the exploration and interaction. I love their interactive sim level of design. And in an open world, I know that's gonna be sacrificed to some extent. I just hope not so much that every building is walled off and instead it's about the rooftops that you can sit on with a sniper rifle and poke some zombies with some bullets and call it a, wait, zombies, oh God. <laughs> and poke some vampires with some bullets and call it a day. 
All right, let's keep reading. We still got more to go through. Redfall is no longer hitting in 2022, as many of us know. Arcane is now aiming for the first half of next year. Despite the uncertainty in date, Smith makes it sound like the team is getting close to the finish line. Quote, we're very clearly past our launch date, he said with a laugh. I don't know what we can say on this, but we're moving toward content lock. And after that, it's just months and months of polish, end quote. Hey, oh, okay. This is the stuff we want to hear because Starfield is also apparently putting the final touches on the game as we talked about in the previous Xbox News update. And I'm like, oh, okay, like, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. If these games are going to get just six to eight months of raw polish, that is really, really encouraging to hear because one thing that PlayStation is known for are the blockbuster exclusives that come out relatively polished. Now, there are some examples, like I think Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was surprisingly buggy and it was not talked about a lot. And I do think that's because PlayStation's reputation kind of buried that level of criticism because they're so consistently putting out bangers that people don't overreact to the bugs. And I think with Xbox, they understand that, you know what, if we're to put out Redfall and it's kind of buggy, it's like, ah, this is okay. Or you put out Starfield, it's like, yeah, this is ambitious, but it's pretty buggy. I think people are going to be less forgiving. And I don't mean to be this guy who, I don't want to sound like I'm peddling console wars, but I think the way people talk about Xbox and Microsoft is vastly different from PlayStation. I do think the goalposts get moved quite often for Xbox and undeservedly so in some instances. So I think Xbox understands the position they're in and it's better to be safe than sorry. Let's take the time to really polish things up. So it doesn't sound like either Starfield or Redfall are in these dire situations currently, given the extra development time they now have. So that is really nice to see. And hopefully when both these games come out, they are very polished. There is more though, and this is the part where I think we get into some of the, the bad news, if you will. Following that reveal, Redfall game designer Harvey Smith spoke to IGN in a new interview about the title's co-op and how it works. Here, Smith revealed that Redfall's campaign progress is tied to the host of the co-op party, and that it's only persistent for that host, as reported by Games Radar. This means that if you're teaming up with someone to play co-op and that you're not the host, you will not receive the campaign progress they might after completing a level. Quote, so for the flow of things, you want to have to redo those, Smith said. The story would be very confusing if you got to Mission 8 and it said, skip this one because you've already done it, end quote. Smith said that Arcane initially tried to give every player some credit for completing a given level when they aren't the host. However, this didn't work out as those same players would then run into that same mission again when playing it solo or as the host of their own co-op session. However, Smith told IGN that character progression aspects such as loot and XP would carry over to your campaign. This I understand because they did provide reasons for it. But one thing I didn't like about Far Cry 6 is one that comes to mind, and it's funny because I was making Far Cry comparisons earlier, is that you would play co-op, and if someone were to join my world, their progress would not carry over when they went back to their open world. And I imagine it's for the same rationale here, that the story wouldn't make sense, that if you checked off a couple of boxes in a co-op session and came back to your own single-player session, it wouldn't make sense why suddenly you were on a different part of the island, I, I guess, and, and that the story had moved so far ahead from where you first were in your single-player session. To me, it's just frustrating because what it does is it binds you to your co-op partner a little too tightly. I like it when co-op is progressed alongside both parties because what happens is that if my buddy is busy for a weekend or something like that and I want to play some Redfall, I can and I'll have my progress. I don't have to retread old ground. Now, is it good that your loot and character progress is there so you don't have to worry about losing that stuff? Yes, absolutely. But to me, I just can't help but be a little whelmed by that. I think of something like Borderlands and the idea of, huh, after I finished all of these end game things, I hop back into my world and I'm level one. Wow, that stinks. So again, I understand why on a tech side they can't really do it and they think it doesn't make sense for the story, but I do find it a, a, a little bit disappointing because I would love to have been able to hop in and out of co-op sessions and just keep progressing on my own. 
All right, now it's time to talk about the Xbox Bethesda Showcase Extended. A couple of announcements were in there. The first was that Valheim is coming to Xbox. It was confirmed that it was coming to PC Game Pass during the showcase, but following a handful of gameplay clips, it was confirmed to also be coming to console. This is aiming for spring 2023, and it will be a console launch exclusive. This is a huge get for Xbox. This is one of the biggest games, and I'm pretty sure it's still in early access, and it's still insanely popular. So a very smart move on Xbox is behalf a lot of strategic moves by them Valheim being one of them Riot Games partnership being another these are moves that may not excite you but are gonna grow the service so that is exciting indeed because hopefully it will mean more deals for people like you and I who care about you know like single player games on Game Pass which we saw a lot of like Flintlock Ravenlock all this stuff looked pretty good continuing on there were a couple of other reveals one of them was Aura History Untold. This is from Oxide Games, and this was known as Project Indus, for those who remember the code name during the rumor mill. It got its first bit of gameplay. It's all pre-alpha, it's very brief, and I was happy to see this here. It was a nice little surprise that felt rewarding for tuning in, right? Because we saw a CG trailer during the showcase, and I was like, why was this even here if gameplay wasn't ready? Then you see it at the extended showcase with brief gameplay, and I'm like, this could have probably fit into the trailer there with the gameplay only mandate. Uh, but nonetheless, here it is in action. I'm excited for another real time strategy game, probably inspired by civilization based off some of the writing on the website. You can sign up for the alpha right now through the insider program, and they'll likely be testing it over time. Continuing on, another day one Game Pass get for Xbox, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, day one. It is coming on its launch day. That is, uh, I mean, wow. You know, for all my horror fans out there, uh, you're gonna be eating good this year when you really look at like Callisto Protocol, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Dead Space Remake. Now this, I mean, some pretty good stuff there. I wanna shout out my boy, Miles Dompier. He is big on Xbox, pushing for this horror stuff. Let that man buy you a drink, Xbox Game Pass, because that is the number one horror fan I know in the Xbox community. Continuing on, another reveal we got from last year was that Slime Rancher 2 is coming day one to Game Pass. Now we have a release window, fall 2022. This is another big deal. Slime Rancher 1 was insanely popular. This game looks really cozy. Looks like a lot of fun. I want to give it a rip, especially this fall looking kind of empty. I'm, I'm more open to trying games like this in, in the meantime. We'll see how much things start to load up as we get deeper in the year. But right now, this looks really appealing, and we do have a release window for it. And these are the kind of things that I was expecting during the gameplay showcase extended was, you know, just updates on things we already knew about. It, it made a lot more sense here. And, it, and they probably should have taken some of the, you know, Xbox Bethesda showcase and put it over in here. You know, the, the updates on 76, the uh, updates on ESO, that, that type of stuff, you know? We learned that Forza Horizon 5's Hot Wheel expansion is going to bring a brand new campaign. I'm not sure how many people expected that, but I know a lot of you out there are Forza fans. If my comment section on my showcase review is anything to go by. Master Chief is coming to Fall Guys. I haven't played Fall Guys since it was free on PS Plus, but I know a lot of you out there are really excited for this game to arrive on Xbox June 21st, and now you'll get to play as Master Chief. Now, I do like the grunt outfit that they have. This thing is just like, it's so adorable. I can't, man. It's like one of my favorite costumes I've seen in Fall Guys. They've had some great ones, like the 2B one was hilarious, but I gotta say, the grunt one is, is easily one of my favorites. Please check it out if you have yet to see it. Last thing, ended the showcase with this one was one of the most moving, probably the most moving trailer I've ever seen in the video games industry because it was the team GSC Game World who's working on Stalker 2 and the reality of developing a game during the war in Ukraine. Uh, Sarah Bond presented this. Uh, you could see she was getting a little choked up talking about it and kind of what the team is going through. And, you know, I, I gotta say, you know, number one, shout out to Sarah Bond, incredible leader at Xbox and uh, just love everything she's doing. And you could just see like we're close to entering a golden era for xbox with it's very rare to see executives who love games so much but also care about the people um and, and manage to run a business that's fun but also profitable at the same time like it's just really rare where we'll be eating good for a while i'd imagine but this trailer really hit hard seeing some of the developers like ready for combat i just i was pretty rattled by it it, it kind of brought things to life even more and uh you know, again, just 
salute to GSC Game World for getting the job done. They uh, showed off the opening cinematic for Stalker 2 as well. They've moved the release date to now 2023, no specific window. Of course, that's completely understandable given that the situation in Ukraine currently, but it's just uh, amazing what they're doing there. And I am excited to play this game for sure. This was one of Xbox's heavy hitters to start this year. Obviously now it's totally understandable why we're not gonna see it for a while, but man, uh, this game is looking great and I can't wait to play it. Shout out to GSC Game World. And that's everything we saw at the Xbox Bethesda Game Showcase. There were some other things in there, some fun little interviews, some little jokes and conversations. We heard a little bit more about High on Life and how it was like a dream game for Justin Roiland, but otherwise nothing really of substance that I can show you here in this video. So let's move on to the last bit of information that I was excited to talk about. We've heard a lot about Xbox acquisitions, but we haven't really seen a, if you will, inside look at what the process was like for acquiring one of these studios, how it was pitched, and what's the vibe now for that team internally. And Obsidian Entertainment had a pretty strong presence at the showcase, albeit with one pretty big missing piece avowed. Uh, not being there and so they were willing to speak out on the impact of Xbox So I took some highlights out of this article from IGN titled Obsidian and why Xbox's acquisition strategy is staying out of the way something we've heard a lot in a negative light So I thought it was important to present it also in a positive light for studios that really benefit from it We've heard it negatively from again studios like Bethesda very recently. We've heard it from undead labs very recently, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, also, of course, in the initiative. So let's keep reading here on why it's a positive for Obsidian. According to Urquhart, acquisition by a giant like Microsoft was a leap of faith. But what ultimately sold them on the idea were two things. First was the substance of what Xbox was pitching. It wanted to let its acquired studios be who they are and retain their creative freedom and studio culture, largely unbothered by Xbox mandates. And then what's really interesting here in this quote is that Fergus Urquhart, CEO of Obsidian Entertainment, talks a bit about just Phil and his overall demeanor and not to treat him like too much of a persona, but that he doesn't really BS and just loves games and he seemed authentic. And that type of leadership made it really easy for Obsidian to buy in. It was something worth putting faith into. And again, that's why I say to people, I feel like we're very close to that golden era of Xbox, like I talked about in my 2023 video, where the future just looks so bright on the leadership front, Game Pass front, console launch exclusive front, the technology, we're really getting there. And again, it's a real testament to the leadership that's been steering the ship since, according to this article, 2014, we'll talk about why in a moment, but uh, it's a real coming of age moment for them, this generation. And uh, it's, it's clear that just authentic personalities can go a long way in these deals. And Phil surely is one of them alongside the rest of the team, like Matt Booty, Sarah Bond, Aaron Greenberg, so on and so forth. But let's keep reading about how long ago this whole process started for Xbox, because you'd think 2018, right, when they started to buy everybody? Wrong, 2014. Before Mo Yang, it was, you're a part of Microsoft. One day, you're a part of the studio, the next day, you're fully Microsoft. And it had varying success, I'll say. So with Mojang, there was an approach taken that we like to call minimal integration, where we looked at the stuff we really needed to have fully integrated. And that's like IT stuff and security policy, that kind of stuff. But we really tried to create stability in these studios to not have the acquisition be something where the whole studio lost focus, where the studio was now trying to figure out this thing called Microsoft. Independence doesn't mean isolation though. McGuane said that Obsidian's case, for instance, she speaks with someone at the studio every few days and there are connection points all throughout all Xbox owned studios. It's not, she says, that they shut the door and Xbox knocks once a year to collect what it's owed. In return, Xbox gets games, obviously, but it's not just after blockbusters. By relieving the pressure of having to scramble for publishing deal after publishing deal, McGuane says that studios like Obsidian can, if they choose to do so, pursue smaller projects alongside their larger endeavors. Grounded and Pentiment are prime examples of this, where Xbox's safety net helped the developer juggle multiple balls at once. Grounded's early access success was significantly bolstered by Game Pass and Xbox marketing, which allowed Obsidian more time and energy for Pentiment, and both games will help the Outer Worlds 2 and Avowed down the line. For Xbox, all of this is to contribute to filling up Game Pass. McGuane tells me, Xbox is playing the long game with not just Obsidian, but all its acquisitions. She says it's not interested in churning out a giant game per studio and then tossing them by the wayside. Rather, it's a part of a larger picture, building a sustainable creative infrastructure that will still be making new things years from now, built from ideas that haven't ever been dreamed up yet. 
What's more, Urquhart has observed a massive improvement in one particular specter from his own past relationship with Xbox. It's dropped its tendency to mandate developers to work on certain kinds of technology it's trying to push, like say, the Kinect. And they also mentioned in this article that it comes across more as like a suggestion, like something with the cloud, something with xCloud where it's like, hey, we got this for you with the Azure server stuff, which more developers have found exciting nowadays, where they're not pushing it, but they're saying like, here's a tool for you. And overall, I found this to be an enlightening read and one that may be encouraging for some of you who are losing the faith a little bit, because after article after article after article about the negative impact, if you will, of Xbox's hands-off approach, you can see how it's really helping certain studios who know how to manage themselves, it seems, and aren't managing themselves into the ground. It just seems like Xbox doesn't want to come in and shift the culture for better or for worse. They just kind of want to let people do their own thing there, which I've always said I do respect, but man, I, I just thought it was really, really cool to see how not searching for publishing deals, which is one of the tougher parts that no one talks about in game development, uh, just selling your game to someone and being like, this thing, by the way, has a really cool story. And they're like, cool, uh, but what do you play? It's like, uh, well, we, you gotta get to that stuff, you know? So it's tough to sell people on a game. So when you got a big giant like Microsoft backing you, uh, it's, it's very encouraging to be like, let's, Shoot for the stars here. Let's do Pentiment, which looks amazing. Let's do Grounded, which really was surprisingly good at launch, and I haven't played it since its early access period. So I'm waiting for that full launch, and I'm going to give that a try. It's awesome to see how far Obsidian's come. And again, people are really behind them without them showing off Avowed or Outer Worlds 2 yet. So the future is bright for them. Anyway, that's all we got in today's video. Let me know what you're thinking about this in the comments down below. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the hell out of the content here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.